Um, good morning or good evening or wherever you are in between. Uh, that is 10 p.m. here in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, really delighted that Kate and Richard, uh, Kirsty and John um, invited me to be part of this today. Um, it's kind of hard to believe that it's been almost a year since we launched the World Outside Report 2020 on, on designing for dementia. And we're actually on the eve of delivering the 2021 World Alzheimer's Report as well on diagnosis, which we'll do on World Alzheimer's Day um, in September. But the creation of this particular report in 2020 was kind of built on 30 years worth of, of research and work. Um, but in a way, it was also the starting point for where we now need to, to go with this as well. So the question was to set the scene, I suppose, was why did ADI commission this report? And, and it was really a kind of a multifaceted um, answer when I, when I started thinking about this. Uh, but I confess, I suppose one of the key factors is that I've got my own personal enthusiasm for design and you know, the difference it can make. So that actually really helped in the, in the process. Also some very, very fortuitous timing. ADI's former chair, Glenn Reese, who I know most of you know, um, introduced me to Richard um, and that really got the ball rolling um, and then of course from ADI's perspective we're always really conscious you know of where the gaps are in information in policy and in practice um, and that all came together to create this this World Alzheimer's report on dignity design and, and dementia and I thought I'd mention just briefly at this point um, the COVID-19 pandemic, because when we commissioned the report, I don't think any of us had any, any insight into what was, was about to happen and the disproportionate impact it would have on people with dementia. Um, we decided um, amongst the co-authors and ADI that we would leverage into the world report a specific chapter on COVID. Um, and it was a really poignant and important chapter. Um, Alison Dawson and the team at Stirling University um, really brought some truly vital questions about design and how it can exacerbate something like an infectious disease, uh, particularly in care settings, but also how, it, how good design can mitigate against it as well. So from a personal point of view, I mentioned that I had an interest in design and this stems from a couple of different experiences in my life. Um, many, many years ago, um, I had a job in the hotel sector and I was site finding doing feasibility studies for, for new hotels. Um, and it gave me a chance to work really closely with architects and designers and something I've, I've always really appreciated. But um, one of the incredible bones of contention within hotel design mainly from hotel operators, but I will also say from guests themselves, was despite the legal requirement to have a certain percentage of rooms that were designed and wheelchair or uh, disability access friendly, there was always a reluctance to do it, almost to minimize the impact of it or to hide those rooms. And I always used to find this incredibly frustrating. Um, you know, why was that negative perception there? when something so integral you now to making a space work was so important. Um, and then of course, I, I had some of my own personal experience in just how influential uh, good design can be. And a couple of pictures up here. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the Maggie sensors. They're mainly in the UK, but they have started to spread to Hong Kong, Tokyo, Barcelona as well. You know, they genuinely are truly inspiring spaces. And the premise for them was to design spaces purposefully to support people going through cancer treatment and to be a complete contrast to the clinical hospital environments. Now, give you a safe, nurturing, calming space for information, therapy sessions, drop-in places for coffee and support. And the Maggie Centers are stunningly designed uh, buildings and spaces, often by world-leading architects, which, which helps in terms of their profile. Um, but as a user of Maggie's, I've had firsthand experience about the power and the value of well-designed care spaces. And it is a million miles from those hospital spaces and what comes with those. And the other picture there is from my time with Alzheimer's Scotland over the last decade. And I got to work with Joyce Gray and the team at Alzheimer's Scotland to create a network of dementia resource centers around the country. And we work with a fantastic design and architect firm called Graven Images. And the inspiration for them effectively was, was from the Maggie sensors. 
So in a roundabout way, um, I'm getting to the back to the point of telling you really why we ended up commissioning the, the World Alzheimer's Report in, in 2020. And then just to, as I'm going to pass over to uh, the other speakers, is to reiterate what Kate outlined for the rest of the session. So we're going to look at the principles of good design and then the vision, the human rights and the design, and come back to the report recommendations from the World Report in 2020 and hopefully get into some really good uh, Q&A with you. So I will stop speaking at that point. And I Thanks, Chris. Uh, that was great and a really good introduction as to why design matters. And we know that design principles are an essential part of good design. And the use of these Fleming Bennett principles were a key part of the ADI report. Um, and Richard, John and I used them to guide our discussion and to shape the report. The principles have been used for over 20 years and we're going to spend about half an hour now exploring these with you. But a couple of things before we start. Um, they're principles, they're not solutions. Design principles guide a design, but they don't say exactly what to do. They're the second part of a four part schema that we identified as part of the ADI report. And design principles respond to higher order goals. So something like designing for dignity. And they also allow for a variety of more detailed design approaches and responses, which are context specific. And John in particular is gonna draw attention to some of these and we'll focus on the approaches that he's well known for. I've selected an image from the case studies in our report to help illustrate the principles. They're just examples. They're from lots of different countries and they show the variety of environments that are possible. So let's get started. So the first principle is unobtrusively reducing risks. Now, while this principle is about creating a safe environment, it's about doing things. We all live with risk. This is about reducing risk by good design. For example, by removing barriers such as uneven surfaces. The key to this principle is to reduce risks unobtrusively. In this example from Singapore, you can see that people have got a number of options for where to sit, how to sit and what to do. John. So let's just take a look at this, um, this photograph for a moment. There's the, 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 the items that Kirsty mentioned are there, which is there's no lip to cross over when you walk into, um, over into the grass from the solid place. There's also, um, it's, it's, a, it's an enclosed area. What we found is that the, the real, one of the, one of the risks, and it's important to identify that, is what I call dangerous invitations to places that are dangerous or difficult to, to manage. In many of the places that we live, the regulations say all doors must be designed in a certain way. It turns out that some doors go to places that are safe and easy to manipulate and easy to manage, and other places are, um, are difficult to manage. So we talk about one way to, to unobtrusively reduce risk to manage this principle in design is not only to get rid of stairs or, or make, make the transition from one space to another easy, but it's also to control the exits to some degree and, and to make the message that the doorways give different so that people can see um, some doorways say, come through this, there's a safe place, there's a safe garden, there's a safe place, a safe room on the other side of this doorway and others that say, stop, don't come through this door. It leads to the mechanical room, for example. Thanks, John. The second um, principle we're going to talk about is providing a human scale. And we know that the fewer people a person living with dementia has to relate to, then the better it's going to be for that person. We also know that we're all impacted by the size of the building and the detailing of the building. 
And that's because we are in relationship with our environment. And I think this graphic gives you an idea perhaps of what I'm talking about quite simply. You can see the woman standing there in the doorway. Imagine if instead of the doorway being the size that it is, imagine if that doorway went all the way to the ceiling, all the way to the top of the purple square. Sort of by default, she becomes smaller. So she's going to feel differently about standing in that doorway when she's surrounded by a really tall space. So we need to be aware that we are in relationship with the environment and that the individual components in an environment do affect how we feel. And what we need to do is, is design them so that we can identify with a human scale and give a human reference. In this example, 100 people live here. The building's been broken up though to create a human scale with a variety of finishes and forms. And it's important to remember, I think, that, that buildings give us messages about what's going on and people form opinions from those images and those messages. And so that's another way that design matters. So, you know, Kirsty's been speaking about human scale. That's a, a, an architectural concept. What this translates to in the approaches is the need for residential scale and residential support. It's not merely a matter of physical space and size. It's also a matter of our brains. In other words, our brains are, since we, at the moment we're born, we have a sense of what is home, of what is my home. It's a hardwired brain concept that we never lose. So creating spaces that are of human scale, that are of residential home-like scale, um, creates comfort and creates the ability to say, I'm not living in an institution, I'm living in my home. And that place, from the time we're a baby, when we're babies, even moving from once after a month, moving from our crib to another room, we cry because we know we feel comfortable at home. And that is something that never changes with dementia or with old age. And the third principle is how do we design to allow people to see and be seen? And you'll see the first point there is called visual access. Now, physical access is a common term that I expect you will have heard of. Visual access is used less often, but is also a really important uh, concept. And there are some key questions that we need to ask to do with visual access, such as, where have I come from? Where am I now? What will I find if I go in this direction? Because if we can see where we want to go and what we might find if we head in this direction, it helps us to make decisions about, do I want to go there? Is that what I'm looking for? Another thing that's really important to stop and think about when we design is when we say we need to ensure that all the key locations can be seen, we need to stop and ask ourselves, what are the key locations? Again, don't assume we know what's important to the people who are going to be using this place, but ask them what's the most important and give priority to, to make sure that those spaces and places can be seen. In this example from Nigeria, when I stand in this room, you can see how we can straight away see where we can go and what we might find if we head in that direction. One of the questions that, 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 that leads from what kirsty has been saying is why is this important to be see and be seen and know where you're going? And one of the answers to that is that there's a common misunderstanding that wandering is a, um, is a symptom of dementia. It is not. It is a result of environments that are confusing. So the confusion that 
leads to people not knowing where they're going is that they can't see where they're going. They don't have a walking path, they have a wandering path. It's a, one of the silliest notions that there exists. If you look at this photograph, I can be where I am, walk to the living room, or I can be where I am and walk to my bedroom because I see it. So the translation into approaches from the principle is that walking paths are very important and that if you can see the destination of where you are going, whether it be in your own home or in some kind of institution, or whether it be in a, this Nigerian example, which as, as the comment is, that's warm and welcoming, it's not only that this is more residential, it's also that it gives us the ability to choose where we're going, to know where we're going, and feeds our brain's ability to walk, to decide, to make choices. These are the values that all of what these principles and approaches are reflecting. Stimulations are really, really big topic and we're only going to touch on it very briefly now. But we know that stimulation can be helpful or unhelpful. And first, I'm going to talk a little bit about unhelpful stimulation. And you can see there, the goal is that we minimise exposure to unhelpful stimulation. And one of the reasons we do this is we know that a person living with dementia is likely to be less able to filter out stimulation. So you're probably very aware of that, that there are many sounds going on, for example, at the same time, and it's hard to put one in the background and one in the foreground. But while we often talk about sound, it applies to, to sight just as much or smell just as much. So we need to think about what is unhelpful stimulation and how do we remove that? But it isn't about removing stimulation. It's not about having a bland, boring space. That is not what this principle is about. Although sadly, I think um, many of us have been into places where people think that they've done the right thing by doing that. It's about reducing that unhelpful stimulation so we can focus on the things that are important. And in this uh, photo from Costa Rica, you can see they've made the whole focus of this room, the library. There's still quite a bit going on, but they've removed, reduced, limited the unhelpful stimulation and focused on the important things. So once again, Kirsty's excellent expression and explanation of what we call unhelpful stimulation principle relates to the fundamental idea that we need the environment to support our brains. Um, the, the term that has been developed in, in, by me and some, some others is echo psychosocial. Echo meaning the, is the Greek word for home. That these environmental messages are messages to our brain and what we need to do is think about unhelpful stimulation and helpful stimulation, which we'll be talking about in a moment, in terms of comprehension. We want to make the environment easily comprehended. And this is not only a matter of dementia, it's a matter for all of us. All of us at the end of the day, when we're leaving where we are and going someplace else, need to have environments that support our brains rather than say, it's the end of the day and you won't be able to figure out where you are. You don't know how to get home. You don't know how to deal with the transportation or whatever it might be. So the issue here that, 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 that Kirsty so excellently explained is that we have to consider all the senses in terms of their comprehension of the environment without these, 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 these disruptions to our brains so that our brains can function as well as possible, because that's really the issue. Kirsty. Thanks, John. And just, just take a moment to look at this image where, again, it's a graphic and it's meant to convey something very quickly, but you'll see then the dismay and the distress that's caused by all of those things going on. Whereas when we look at the next principle, which is about optimizing helpful stimulation, 
we're again graphically showing you what's possible when we don't have everything battering the senses. As John highlighted, we need to think about all the different senses, but we also need to start at the beginning by asking ourselves, so not only how do we optimise helpful stimulation, but what are the things that matter? What are the important things? And I expect that if we had time to do a quick poll now, all of us would give different answers for the things that are most important to us. So that's again, we, where it's really, really important to design very specifically for people and apply this principle in a very particular context. You'll notice there's the third term there, redundant cueing, that I just would like to touch on. Cues are things that give us messages, give us an idea about um, how to behave, how to respond, what to do, what I might find somewhere. Redundant cueing is the idea that because different things are important to us, different cues will be meaningful for us. So for example, I might be looking out my um, window and be struck by the grapevine and think, oh, yep, yep, isn't that lovely? I know where I am now because I can see the grapevine. John mightn't be paying any attention to that at all. He might have seen a gum tree in the distance and that's what he's focusing on. Kate perhaps has seen the chair that's sitting in front of the window and she remembers the pattern on the cushion. So there are three cues that say, come and sit by the window, but we're picking different things because different things resonate with us. And that's where redundant cueing is really important to give a richness to the environment. Again, remembering, as I said, it's not about removing stimulation. It's about creating very rich and life-giving environments that are meaningful to us all. And that's where the skill comes in to do that in a way that all of these cues don't become too much. We can see one example here in Australia where there are so many different things that can be positive, helpful stimulation, but they've been designed to create a whole that's very calm and peaceful. And I know, John, you really like this setting. Um, well, this is, a, this is a very rich concept here. When you look at this photograph, you see nature, you see light, you see windows where there are people, you see doors where there is home. In other words, there's a lot going on here that helps, again, going back to the very simple concept that help our brain understand where we are. And I wanna stress, this is not dementia related, this is everyone related. And when Kirsty speaks about redundant cueing, what she means is if we have three messages all saying the same thing, three messages from the environment, all saying, inviting us to the same message, we, we will understand it better and we have to work less hard in our brain. So the other point that Gersti's made, and I just wanna re rephrase it, is that we're talking about personalized messages. We're talking about personalized and individual comprehension. It's vital that the environment enable us to comprehend it as, 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 as well as we can. And that means to stop putting up barriers to understanding, but opening doors to understanding. And whether it be reducing unhelpful or optimizing helpful stimulation, we're talking about sensory comprehension. And each of us needs the environment to be rich enough to choose which elements there are. And this, um, this design by Alan Kahn, a close friend of ours in Australia, a wonderful architect, demonstrates this when you walk through the space, you feel comfortable, you feel at ease, you feel like you've understood it. Uh, there was one comment about echo. The, the term echo in the way I'm using it is E-C-O, like an ecological. And echo in Greek means home. So it's the physical environment that we must respond to as we are in these important principles that Richard and, and Kirsty have developed and the approaches that I've brought to, to bear. And John, I, th I think it's worth picking up too on that point you made about this is good design for everyone. 
And that's something that, that we know as well in talking about these key design principles. We know that they're particularly important for someone who is living with dementia, but regardless, we all need to know where to go. We're all looking for what do I do next? We are all trying to make sense and interpret and understand our environment. So in its most simple fashion, these design principles are simply about designing well. Let me just add, if I might, before you go on, Please. which is you're absolutely correct. It is for everybody. The difference, of course, is that some of us can deal with, 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 with confusing messages a little bit more easily than others. But exactly. on the other hand, we're doing the work. The work is being done by our brains. Yep. Why should we be spending our time doing that work? And others, in, in, in many cases, have difficulty doing that work uh, and get confused, which is understandable. Yes, and yet we know if we design well, the environment can do the work for us. Exactly. And I, think, I think we've all had that experience, and hopefully all of us have had that experience at some time when we walk into a building and just feel great, and we just have this sense of where to go and what to do and what's expected of us. And we've probably all had that experience. To me, hotels come to mind, where you walk <laughs> out your door and you think, where am I? What am I meant to do now? Um, I don't remember where the lift is. But as you said, John, then it's about the, the work we have to do to interpret the environment. And, yes. and it's just not necessary, is it? No. Good point. So, so let's talk now about um, supporting movement and engagement. The key with this principle is engagement. John mentioned before about um, that term wandering that used to be used a lot. And, and there used to be an idea when I started out that we needed actually to design so, so a person living with dementia could keep, keep walking. And thank goodness we have learned. I mean, while we might be disheartened sometimes at where we're at, we need to, I think, also celebrate the progress that has been made. And we're much, much more aware now as, as to why people move and, and what we are all looking for. And the key is engagement. It isn't about moving, it's about being engaged. So while we do need to be clear about where to go and what we might find if we, if we get there, so we need things like a route that's well-defined and we need to think about being inside and outside and we don't need obstacles, so again, you might be making a connection with that very first principle. The principles are very much interrelated. The key is, what is of interest here? What is there that I would like to do, again, that helps my life continue to have meaning? Because that, again, is the question that all of us are asking. And, and it's not about having a lot of area. Look, look at this woman watering a garden in Indonesia. John. I know you're really passionate about this topic. Yeah, well, it's, it, you, you, your, your, your comments are excellent. And um, the first, I'd like to go back to what you just said about meaning and purpose. Essential to our lives is meaning and purpose. It is one of the five ways to delay any form of dementia, which is to have purpose. And the environment can give us those purpose. Engagement is one of the clear view, one of the clear messages. Um, so, um, so, so, so having a garden to, to tend is a form of engagement and a form of purpose that's very important. Interestingly, this message, this principle has to do with internal and external. We need to support movement and engagement internally and externally. On the other hand, one of the things that we might stress differently is the importance of outdoors. Um, outdoors, having free access to outdoors, having a clear way to get back inside that's safe when we are outdoors. Um, there's a term called sight giver, which is time giver. Nature and, and the, the sun and the moon and nature and, and, and the weather gives us a sense of time. And once again, many people talk about how people living with dementia have problems with knowing the time and dealing with daytime and nighttime. Men, being outdoors like the diagram shows 
and having nature um, has um, all of these things provide engagement and support movement, not only with destinations, but also being outside. Um, people have talked to you in, the, in, the, in the chat about the importance of having, um, of having movement supported by destinations, by objects, by what we call landmarks. Landmarks is another thing that is hardwired in our brain. If we go to a place in the diagram, there are flowers, there's a fountain, there's a bench. These are landmarks that tell us where we are and where we're going. And we can breathe more easily because we know where we are. Absolutely. Another thing that, that's really important to do is to create a familiar space. Now, lots of things make a place familiar and we're really conscious that it's going to be different according to our lifestyle, our cultural background, climate, a whole range of things. So again, we're working at a principle level when we're talking about this. It's really important we don't say, uh, we don't assume what is familiar. And that's, I think, often something that, that we find that people, designers will assume what is familiar to someone and what someone wants. So again, this always comes back to the person. The principle is about how do we create something that's familiar? And it affects all aspects of design. And while some of those things are listed there, such as furniture selection and furnishings and colors and things like taps, and they are absolutely really important. But it's also actually about the layout of a building, um, how doors relate to a garden, the relationship between outside and inside. All of those things are also familiar to us, depending on our life experience and where we live. So we need to, to think about how we create a familiar space in the broadest possible way and and not let it be put in a little box and say we know this is what's familiar a Laura, Laura Ashley armchair is pretty common in Australia in places don't don't let that happen think about all the different things and again if we were to come to our different homes we'd see very different homes we'd see we live in different places and like different things and that's really important as designers and in talking to designers that we make sure that's taken into account and is still possible. This image from Japan is one that I really like because it, it shows both the complexity of this principle, but also that with good design, you can do anything. Because here in Japan, they're looking at how do we sit? So some people might like to sit at a table. Some people might like to sit on a tatami. Both are possible, but it's a really well-rounded, holistic design, a quality design, but a very thoughtful interpretation of what is a familiar space, recognising it won't be the same for everyone. The translation of this familiar space, which obviously is clear in this common area, if you look at the diagram, at the diagram on the left, you see a person with their bookshelf, with their window, with their, um, their flowers. One way to think about this is the importance of having a place of your own. Um, it could be called privacy, but it really means my place. Our environment communicates to us who we are. The message of, of, of my work, which is I'm still here, is it's my place and I want to know who I am within that setting, within that context, whether I live with dementia or not. So what are the things that, that, that tell us what we are? It's our, our, our certificates. It's the photographs of our past. It's our history. And our familiar space reflects who we are. And once again, leads to that hardwired state of knowing who we are. Everyone with or without dementia never loses a sense of who we are and what our story is. And the more the environment can give us that message, can send us the message, you are who you are, you are okay, you have a history, 
you have a, a, a place in this world, the, the better it does. And this principle of creating a familiar place leads to that understanding. Absolutely. And we're going to pick up on that, aren't we, in the next couple of principles as well, John. Um, this second last one that, that John and I are going to talk to you about is how do we provide opportunities to be alone or with others? Choice is important. You can see that's a common theme coming through. And as an architect, it's, it's really exciting to have a challenge to design so that a place is designed, but it's designed with opportunities and possibilities rather than designing in a particular way that obliges people to behave in only one way, to only do one sort of thing. So we want to think about how can we give people that choice? Because we don't want to do the same thing all of the time. There are times when we want to be alone. There are times when we want to be in a small group. There are times when we want to be in a large group. But we need to do that and design for that, taking all of these other design principles into account so that these places are familiar, so that we have managed the stimulation, so we can see and be seen. All of those things still apply within this principle. And think about, again, how we do this both inside and outside. And this example from the States um, shows some of the possibilities uh, that are there in this internal setting where people can sit and relax in either small groups or with others. John, would you like to take it up from there? Yes, the, the, this photograph, by the way, is from Abe's Garden, uh, a residence in Nashville, Tennessee, that is a, a, a national um, uh, example of, 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 of quality design. Let me just say that this discussion that Kirsty presented of choice, of the importance of choice, before we get into what you're choosing, is an essential value and an essential and critical point of this entire presentation. Choice, given, when people, when all of us, when each of us can choose what we want to eat, where we want to go, what we want to dress, what time we're going to get up in the morning, it communicates dignity to ourselves. It communicates respect to ourselves. So the theme that I've been talking about are the messages that are communicated through the environment. And this, 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 this message about we can choose to be where we want to be alone or with others, what isn't in the photograph, of course, is the privacy space that we talked about. But choice is, is, is an essential part of our knowing who we are, being able to choose. We lose that ability when somebody says, this is when you're going to eat, this is what you're going to eat, this is what you're going to do. So continuing to provide choice in this way, to be alone, to be with others, to be in a small group that the environment can produce is fundamental to this entire conversation that we're having that Richard Kirsty and I and Chris have, 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 have engaged in. And I hope to hear from some of you in the question and answering about how you feel about this issue. And the last principle that John and I will talk about is, is providing links to the community. And that's something that John's already touched on. Being a part of the community is important for all our identity. And whether I'm living with dementia or not, it doesn't alter the importance of that need to be a part of the community. And that's really what this principle is about. Again, this is a positive principle as are all the others. It's about saying a person is a part of the community, a person contributes to the community, regardless of of where someone lives and what someone does. So as with principle one, this is about living. And we need to think though, how we design to make sure people can continue to contribute to the wider community if they're living with dementia. 
So designing dementia friendly communities has become a bit of a, a term and certainly something we've been working on, but actually designing communities that are accessible and welcoming for everyone is a really, really important thing. And we need to recognise that we need to do that so that we all have the chance to benefit from each other, because we are all going to benefit from having a richer community. It's about how do we design so we can all be at our best and all take our part. And I don't know about you living uh, here in, in Melbourne over these COVID times last year in particular, we had a very long lockdown and we had a requirement that we could only go within five kilometres of home for about four months. And that really highlighted how important our local community is and how much we need to be connected to that community when that's all we have. And it was this really interesting sort of positive side effect perhaps of something that was very, very tough but so many people have talked about recognising how important it is to have those links to the community. The example that I chose is uh, from France, uh, where they've designed around a central square. And we know in many places to have a, a central square, a place where people can gather, is really, really <laughs> important. We need to design this well so that we can all benefit and all use it. I believe that um, this is a photograph of what is called the, the French dementia village. And the, the concept, by the way, the, the concept which grew in the Netherlands uh, and was developed there was not called the dementia village until a journalist arrived and said, I'm going to call this place the dementia village. So it was invented by a journalist to call it that. Now, why is that important? It's important because our identity is not only who I am, it's also in the relationship to others, the I-thou relationship, which creates identity. Um, Tom Kitwood spoke about this in his very important book called Dementia Reconsidered. But the third element of who I am is who we are, and we are part of a community. So this principle linking to the community is not merely a matter of saying, gee, we should be able to go outside, and be part of a larger community. It is we need to be identified and be able to identify and create our identities through being part of a community because it is one part of the I am, I and thou, and we are, which create who we are and enabling us as individuals living with dementia, living without dementia, to, to say, to, to use the community, to use the relationships, um, to identify who we are and to remain present to that reality. So John and I now, are, thanks John, we're gonna hand over now to um, Richard, who's going to uh, introduce the last of the design principles, but also um, start by saying a bit more about using design principles. Now, Kirsty and John have explained and illustrated nine principles, and I'd like to introduce you to a resource that may help, help you to use them. So about 10 years ago, the Alexander Association of Western Australia use these principles in the development of a website. The goal was to illustrate the application of the principles in a variety of settings. Let me just go to that website and show to you. So in this website, there are a variety of plans provided, but the interactive plans, they allow you to click on, in this case, a living room in an ordinary house, And you're presented with an illustration of something you might, of a room you might find in that house. Now here's an illustration of a pretty old fashioned living room in an Australian house. And the nice thing about it is that you'll see all of these little crosses. They provide you with the opportunity to understand the dementia design uh, principles that have been applied in, the, in this living room. So for example, if I click on this, across here, 
it tells me that this family photograph has been included in response to principle seven, which both uh, Kirsty and John uh, so eloquently talked about. The, the, the principle that says that we should include familiar and personal objects in the environment to maintain the identity of the person and also to encourage the reminiscence, which is, is very important in, in old age. If we click on another one of these little crosses, we refer to principle five and encourage to use different textures in the living room to add sensory variation. So you can see that you know, by playing with this website, you can in fact begin to understand how to apply the principles. And it's not just restricted to uh, a person's home. Well, that, that, that's, that was the starting point for the, web, for the website and it's very important. The website also provides a similar approach to developing environments uh, in residential care, in gardens, in public buildings, and in hospitals. Let's have a quick look at the hospital one. This is the most recent one. So we have a plan of a fairly typical hospital layout. Let's have a look at the, at the ward situation. And what we have here is an image of a very sterile and perhaps typical ward. But the website allows you to use this slider to reveal what that ward would look like if the principles of design were applied. And then to click on these little tiles and to get a, a more detailed explanation as to how, uh, you know, how the principles have been applied. So I'm, I'm simply showing this to you uh, in, the, in the hope that if you want to go into the application of these principles in more detail, you'll access this resource and have a look at how they can be applied in a great variety of settings. Now, there is a 10th principle, and that is that the building must be designed to support a vision for a way of life. Now, this is most clearly seen in the design of residential care centers for people living with dementia. And many of the uh, examples that uh, Kirsty and John used were from, were from such settings. And I think that one of the messages that came from their presentation is clearly there's no one size fits all design. Every residential care setting should be designed to support the way of life enjoyed by its residents. And at the very least, that means that the design must reflect the local culture and values. And you can see different examples from Singapore to the Netherlands, Iran and the United Kingdom here. And the ADI report contains 84 case studies illustrating the application of principles in a huge variety of settings. I really recommend that you have a look at it. But ideally, we should go even further than that, as is the case in some pioneering examples of designing for people living with dementia, like the Hogaway in the Netherlands. In this place, residents choose an environment that suits their background. They have actually quite an incredible choice they can choose a background that reflects an urban setting, an aristocratic uh, uh, way of life, a working class way of life. Because of, the, because of the, the Netherlands links with Indonesia, there's even a house that reflects uh, that, that cultural background, homemaking, uh, a theatrical background, and a religious background. This is a very, very clear uh, example of a place that's been deliberately designed to make sure that the environment supports a particular vision for a way of life. And in many ways, that 10th principle is an overriding principle. And while there's no one size fits all design solution, there is a growing consensus that all of the positive visions for a way of life have a common foundation. They have a commitment to dignity, autonomy, independence, equality of opportunity, and non-discrimination in the lives of people living with dementia. I can say this with some confidence because of the growing influence of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The CRPD is the first comprehensive human rights treaty in the 21st century. 
It follows decades of work by the United Nations to change attitudes to people with disabilities. It reaffirms that all persons with all types of disabilities must enjoy all human rights and fundamental freedoms. In a nutshell, it states that dementia leads to disabilities. And very, very importantly, by saying this, it lays the foundation for arguing that people living with dementia should be afforded the same rights as people with physical disabilities. Now, as well as the general rights not to be discriminated against, to be provided with reasonable accommodation, to access and participate fully in all aspects of life, to live independently in a community and to work on an equal basis with others, the CRPD specifically instructs state parties, I mean, that's, that's a technical phrase, I suppose, I guess they mean countries, to take measures to ensure that people with disabilities, remember that that means people with dementia, have access to the physical environment on an equal basis with others. And it states that these measures should include the identification and elimination of obstacles and barriers to accessibility, both indoors and outdoors. The CRPD puts an obligation on the countries or the state parties to undertake or promote research and development of universally designed goods, services, equipment and facilities and to promote universal design in the development of standards and guidelines. For those of you who really want to go into this in detail, that's Article 4, General Obligations. Now this has resulted in obvious and welcome changes to public buildings and spaces in many countries. I mean, we're all aware of the raised buttons to mark curbs, audible warnings at pedestrian crossings, ramps in public buildings, things which have become commonplace. And these, of course, help people with sensory or physical disabilities. But I think we have to admit that as yet, there's, there haven't been any widespread modifications for people living with dementia. And one of the you know, real reasons for our meeting today is to ask the question, how can this omission be, be addressed? Well, one of the ways to address it is to cover is covered in the first of the eight recommendations in the ADI report. This recommendation takes as its starting point the fact that there isn't yet an international consensus on the design principles that would be used for advising the state parties on how to design well for people living with dementia. Now ADI has undertaken to bring this consensus into being by starting a discussion on the development and adoption of these principles. And this international discussion is being provoked by the publication of a website that puts forward the principles that have been presented to you this morning. And as Kirsty and John said, these principles are based on well over 20 years work, more like 30 years work. They are well accepted across the world, they've been translated into Japanese, Chinese, German, etc. So the, a reasonable starting point for this international discussion. And they've been published in the form of a manifesto. Now this manifesto starts with a statement of values. These values come from our own experience and very, very importantly and significantly, the experience of collating and editing the contribution to the ADI report from 58 experts based in 17 countries. They can be summarized as being committed to the view that good design for people living with dementia entails respecting their dignity, their autonomy, their independence, equality of opportunity, and non-discrimination. The website was launched on May the 1st. As of today, 267 people from 33 countries have signed it. And, and in so doing, indicated their agreement with the principles and the values. 
The signatories range from people living with dementia and their carers through representatives of advocacy, advocacy organizations like National Alzheimer's Associations, to experts in design, such as architects and researchers, to people in highly influential positions, such as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and even a member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. Now the signatories to the manifesto are invited to provide comments and suggestions that will lead to its refinement. So it can become a true consensus document, a truly international consensus document. Kirsty, John and I are currently analyzing these comments with a view to producing a first draft of the consensus manifesto by the end of August. And this will be circulated to all signatories for their comment. Comments will then be analyzed and a final draft of the manifesto published in October. Now I'd like to ask those of you who have not seen this manifesto to have a look, especially if you would like to make some comments on how to make environments better for people living with dementia. When the manifesto has been refined to properly represent the views of the signatories, it will be used as the foundation for a brief document describing the conditions required to design well for people living with dementia. And it's intended that this document will be made available to those developing dementia action plans, particularly national dementia plans. Now, Chris has more to say on this, so it's my turn to hand over to Chris. So following on from um, the excellent uh, presentation uh, from, from Kirsty and John, and then Rich's focus on the recommendations and on the, the manifesto, let me draw your attention, if I can, to um, recommendation two from the report. Um, and this is a call for the overt consideration and inclusion of dementia-related design in national dementia plans. Now, I know that a lot of you are probably already involved and have been involved in working groups, have worked with your national associations and regional bodies in terms of the formulation of some of the national plans that exist already. But if you, if you bear with me, I just want to set the scene a little bit um, for you as well. So let me jump back to 2017 and the World Health Organization launched the Global Action Plan on Dementia. And one of the things that I'm finding most powerful about this at the moment is that as we reach the halfway point, some of the key goals of this plan are being missed. But what's very poignant about it is that all 194 member states unanimously adopted the plan. Therefore, the inference is that they must deliver against it. Now, what we found in terms of um, the drive to include dementia-related design in national dementia plans. And I think it's, Jan may be on the call, actually. Um, Jan wrote a great chapter in the, the, the report last year, which looked at just how well that is happening so far. And it isn't actually happening very well at all. But what you see from this map is that the, the deeper red shaded countries are the 40 countries around the world that currently have plans in existence. The gray countries that those have them in development. Now, just in terms of numbers, that's 40 out of 194 governments so far that have developed plans. And of those plans that exist, I think five of them have dementia related design, design integrated into them. So when you first hear that, you think that's actually a huge gap, but simultaneously, it's also a huge benefit um, or a huge opportunity, sorry, you know, in terms of influencing going forward. Um, and I think what struck me about this was, in essence, and, and Kate will probably talk about this later on, is the voice of people with dementia in terms of influencing national plans is perhaps one of the most important and valuable assets we've got in this drive to include dementia-related design. I think though, one of the things that's come out of the conversation that, that has really dawned on me today, um, this morning, this evening, um, is also about the areas that this involves. So dementia-related design and national dementia plans 
multiple areas and we've we've talked about them today you know we we've looked at care facilities care environments design at home design in public spaces and we purposely didn't have the 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 capacity or the time to start to look at things like uh, public transport but what i'm really keen on as we drive towards the inclusion of, of dementia related design in national plans that governments take this on so it is in the broadest remit of it, that it does include public spaces as well, and it does include transport and every area where people are in the same way that it would in terms of physical disabilities. Bear with me one second. Which leads me on to, I think it's probably my final slide before we start to get into some discussion about this. And I wanted to pick up and echo really um, what Richard was saying about the Convention of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD. Um, I know Kate is particularly active in this area. I know the DAI in general are active in this area. Um, in essence, I think the key to what Richard said here was that this is a call for design guidelines that should be provided for living, uh, for people living with dementia in the same way that they are provided for people living with disabilities, because in essence, they are the same thing. And I don't really think that that has been absorbed or, or distilled to any great degree. If I can, let me take you back to, to my hotel example. I was really happy that Kirsty picked up on this very anecdotally as well. Um, hotels, you know, they are places where we temporarily stay, temporarily live. Uh, but they can be incredibly complex and difficult spaces. Um, I know a number of hotels have embraced the form of dementia friendliness. You know, they've trained staff, um, especially in things like other you know, conference areas. Um, but I'm not aware of any one hotel operator that fully embraces dementia-related design in both public and private spaces. Um, please correct me, anybody, if, if you know of anyone that's doing it, because we should showcase them. But taking that thought process and looking ahead, wouldn't it be amazing if hotel operators and care managers and bus companies and cafe owners and sports centers and everybody else all had to consider dementia-related design from the outset in the same way that more and more and more of them through CRPD are taking it on for physical disabilities. And then there's a natural leap to the brief and the commission of architects and designers to deliver it. And Richard, to, to pick up on something you said, it's, it's taken 30 plus years to get to, to this point. And I suppose in the same way that a lot of the targets of the global plan are being missed, and the realization is that we need some mobilization and acceleration, I think we also now need this by galvanizing um, around this manifesto and driving forward these recommendations. So that's it from, from me. Thank you so much, um, uh, Kirsty, John, Chris, and Richard, for such an engaging um, presentation. Uh, and we've had some fabulous comments along the way. I think I wanted to just uh, mention something you said early on, Kirsty, was that uh, whilst we might be disheartened sometimes about what we might see as a lack of change, we also need to celebrate what has changed or is changing and, and I often get disheartened heartened. so it was good to hear that thank you um, and I think the other thing that stood out for me is in your presentation Richard you highlighted how um, the relevance of the CRPD to people with dementia who are people with acquired disabilities is becoming more and more prominent and if we don't embrace that then why are we even talking about it um, and, and that's one of the reasons I campaigned so hard to have dementia recognised as a disability at the time of diagnosis, um, because we do have the same rights as everybody else. Um, I, I think what I would like to do is just hand over, I didn't really say very much about it at the very beginning, I would like to hand over to Emily Ong in a moment. Um, she's um, initiated uh, a special interest group on environmental design of which everyone here, some people have already um, shown interest to become members uh, and everyone's welcome 
to send in an expression of interest to join. But Emily, I, I wouldn't mind handing over to you just to talk about that a little bit, because I think that's a way that we as a community of people with dementia and professionals and advocacy organisations and, and people working in the sector can perhaps move forward and try and create some action as well. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. And uh, I'm very happy to hear about the present uh, the presentation just now from uh, all the speakers. And uh, the reasons that uh, I I started with this idea of wanting to form this group, you know, um, on the environment and dementia, is because I want it to be from the perspective of person living with dementia, because. Uh, well, all these principles are, uh, are very good, but um, in, in the actual practice, we are all still living in our own home. We are still moving around within our own community. And uh, this, these principles needs to be put into the, uh, implement into the community that we, we are staying. And uh, especially, uh, so, but I found that is, uh, it is, it is not happening. And uh, so that is why I want to do a, a group that comprises not just architects and you know, environmental uh, design experts, but also people living with dementia and also other people, uh, uh, professionals that is like allied health, ed, allied health professionals to be inside so that they can all these inputs from on the how the way the, the brain changes, how we interpret the environment, our relationship and interaction with the environment are taken into consideration. So that is the purpose of it. And also the other purpose, the, the bigger purpose is we want to see, we want to create a real change, you know, action. And that action is only possible when, you know, people comes to this group, to this uh, dementia, uh, environment and dementia special interest group, come together after the discussion, they bring back their discussion and rich understanding to their own community. Like take for example, every time I, I attend the, the group, I always pick up certain things and then I bring back and I, I, I work with my local, uh, Alzheimer's uh, Association, and then uh, we look into transport because transport is a very key, uh, what you call, a very important part of independence because a lot of us who have not able to drive or who have our driving license being taken away. So we only have the public transport to count to continue to maintain our independence. So, so when, when uh, what I do is that I will I I get other people living with dementia to be involved and do a side work and talk with the transport people on how to improve the transport platform and uh, uh, the concourse area whereby it's always very noisy. How to make it more accessible and for people who are living with dementia who are would have a language issue. So how, what other modes of accessibility for communication is made available? And now when we are not able to have our language in the sense that the, the society understand, but a different form of communication. So, so this is what I felt that if, if all the people who are, you know, are professional experts and uh, healthcare professionals and people living with dementia come together to form this group. And then, uh, and then everyone go back and create that ripple effect. And these principles designed from the World Alzheimer's Report, plus all the other inputs from the discussion can be bring back. And every one of us become a change agent. So these reports are really being not mobilized rather than just put it there. Because from my experience, when I work with any, uh, our local community, nobody go and refer to it. And when they do design something that is made to make uh, accessible, like uh, no, all the ramps and things like that, the lift, it is all tucked away somewhere. Like what Chris said, 
it's like it's it's very shameful to have that thing make it uh, obvious for people. So people are already have cognitive impairment. Now this thing that is being uh, put into the environment for us, but it is tucked away. It's no longer intuitive for us to go and find it. If we can find it, we are no longer connect. Don't live with cognitive impairment already. So that is why I want it to be, you know, to, to talk to, uh, to hopefully this, this group can be in a sense that uh, we can promote this uh, environment design into a very communal thing. It is just like these things are designed with that in mind and not because you are a person living with dementia or you are a person living with different ability, but it is a it is a communal design that it is meant to welcome everybody. So, so yeah, I, I hope that, you know, uh, I, I have uh, you people on board to join the, the group and then with each one of us become the change agent to make it, to make this a reality. Yeah, thank you, Kat. Thanks so much, Emily. I think you've highlighted really, um, to me, the absolute importance of, of all of us needing to become change agents so that reports and research doesn't just sit on a shelf somewhere, um, have its launch and then nothing happens in our communities to actually improve the lives of people with dementia and their families. And, um, you know, many people have said before, if you, if you make uh, a community or a home or, or an organisation accessible to people with dementia, then it's more accessible to everybody.